Yes. Good afternoon, all. We are here for an application hearing in the matter CA-003-2015 before Justice Sir Richard Field. Claimant is represented by Hamdana Shamsi. Lead counsel is Roger Bowden. Defendant is represented by Altamin Yanko. Lead counsel is Robert Karar Luzli, assisted by Rita Jabala and Robert Matlomach. Mr. Bowden. Yes. Good afternoon. Uh, a few words of introduction. I've had the opportunity to read quite widely into all these papers. <clears throat> I want you to endeavor to conclude your submissions by half past four. The longest extension I will grant to that is till five o'clock. I want to start with the procedural question. What order the court should make, if any, in respect of the fact that you filed a notice of appeal instead of a notice for an oral rehearing uh, within the seven days, but it was a notice of appeal and not a notice for a rehearing. Now, <clears throat> help me with this. Are there any rules of the court which are breached which specify a particular sanction? No. Well, let me tell you what my preliminary view is, and that is that the court should make an order extending time for the service of the notice for a rehearing, which was what towards the end of March. And in case it should be necessary, grant relief against sanctions, although it appears that such a, an order would um, not be necessary from what you tell me about the state of the rules. But on terms that you, um, your side pay the, the costs of the fifth affidavit of Rita Catherine Jabala. Now, I'll give you five minutes if you wish to argue for an improvement on that state of mind. I don't think you You don't. Well, that's um, how the court will deal with the procedural difficulty. Uh, and you may now begin your submission. That takes me right through, I think, to paragraph 37 of the submission I filed yesterday, sir. Yes. Now, just if, if I might say, sir, please do feel to um, feel free to, to take me to the particular points that you wish me to address in relation to this. Um, I, I assume from your illustrious background, sir, that you are far more well familiar with the uh, rules of English procedure than I am, which is, uh, essentially is what we're dealing with here. Uh, so I'm very. Well, I wouldn't be too ready to make that assumption. Thank you, sir. But. Um, <coughs> that it's no doubt that this is a re uh, this is a re hearing. It, it is in effect a de novo hearing. I agree. However, as your submissions acknowledge, the court can't simply put out of its mind the reasons that have been given by uh, Justice Roger Giles. Yes. Uh, the court may be um, assisted by having regard to his uh, account of the uh, factual background, his <coughs> identification of the submissions that were made to him, and then of course there are his reasons. Now is there anything in Justice Giles's um, narrative of the factual background which is not uh, accepted? No, sir, I, I accept that um, in, in terms of the narrative Justice Giles set out, uh, he got it yes. entirely correct, sir. Now, he, he um, dealt with the application on the basis of the grounds of appeal that were before him. Yes. He, could do, um, he, he, could, he could only do that because, of course, it was on the papers and wasn't an, an oral hearing. Now, can I take it that the submissions you propose to make to me are 
within the four corners of your grounds of appeal. They are indeed, sir. They are essentially the grounds that were uh, before Justice Jarman. Yes, sir. What you're seeking from this court on a, a rehearing is <coughs> a different conclusion with respect to the issue whether uh, there is a real prospect of success on appeal. That would be right, wouldn't it? It is indeed. Yes. Um, you don't put forward uh, contentions based on <coughs> the, the concept of other compelling reasons. Well, to the extent, sir, that His Honour, the Deputy Chief Justice, decided the matter ultimately on the question of relevance. So at, at the end of the day, sir, the, the judge said that the points put forward by, by the claimants, oh, sorry, that the, the, he said the RAP4 submission or witness statement does not fall within the terms of the order that yeah. they made on 28 October, yeah. 3B and 5B, and it is therefore irrelevant to the issues before the court. Now, in, in a, as a procedural fairness point, it, it does not appear that that question of relevance was argued. On 28 October, I hasten to add, sir, that I was not present, um, but that, that is what I'm uh, effectively informed by counsel, sir. That was an argument. Well, that isn't strictly right, you know. When you look at the transcript, it's clear that Mr. Brindley, on more than one occasion, submitted that the losses which are identified in RAP 4 don't fall within the order. They don't fall within those particular words that describe the ABK losses, the relationship between the claimants and ABK. So I've got the initials wrong in that way. Well, um, and uh, Mr. Hill would have been well aware that that uh, was Mr. Brindle's, one of Mr. Brindle's positions. It's true that Mr. Brindle was emphasising to a greater extent uh, his argument that uh, because there had not been a flip trial, that <coughs> um, anything that occurred afterwards should be excluded. But he did make the point, to my recollection, certainly twice, that in any event, Rack 4 dealt with losses that were not caught by the wording of the order. And I, I would seek to distinguish that as, as a more of a pleadings point, sir, that he was saying it wasn't pleaded, this could have been brought before trial. Um, well, that was, a, that was one of his other points. We can go to the transcript if you like. <coughs> but he, he distinctly made the point that it wasn't, these losses were not captured by the order. Well, I'm, I'm content shall to leave that we? there, sir, because that, that was... Well, I don't want to... Um, I, I, I read the transcript this morning. Yes, sir. Um, I'm, I don't want to be making a, a, a false point. Let's see if I've got something marked up that I can show you. This was the hearing on the 12th of January, wasn't it? Well, 
Just have a look at um, page 50 of the transcript. says, my learned friend as Mr. Hill suggests, and one could see if that was simply the only material that one was looking at, that that effectively allows him, provided he can show some sort of connection with APK, to show that that is something that he can bring in. But I respectfully suggest that your lordship did not intend anything as wide as that. Then give me a moment. Look at page 92. Slightly above the second hole punch. Sir John Chadwick says, I think I have to decide, do I not, whether this is properly to be regarded as the claim which arises out of his relationship with ABK. Now, Mr. Brindle wants to um, put his pleading point in the foreground. But it's quite clear the way the judge is looking at it, isn't it? And that is reflecting the relevant wording in the order in 3B and 5B. I think you agree. Yes, sir. I do. Just give me one more minute. I have indeed highlighted that uh, point myself, sir, as, as really uh, indicating the ultimate issue. And then over the page of 93, about a third of the way down, is still Mr. Brindle. He makes a pleading point, and then he says, my learned friend is wrong in my submission, to construe your lordship's order. That's the order that <coughs> settled the precise orders consequential on the judgment that was made on the 28th of October. Well, this, is, this effectively allows a complete carte blanche to, to bring anything, provided it had some connection or other with APK. That was not what your Lordship had in mind, I submit. My submission, it does not appear to be what your Lordship had in mind in October. It is in my submission wrong. I'm quite happy to concede at this point, Sue, that uh, Round four of the points of appeal might be something, something of a make way. Yes. I, I think, fortunately for me, sir, I, I do have strong points. Yes, all right. And I, can, I, can I say right now, sir, I, in fact, Your Honour, having point, pointed those passages out to me, I accept what Your Honour says and, and I press that point. All right. Uh, right. Well, it's time for the court to fall silent to give you a chance to get into well, your submission. Well, thank you for pointing that Please, out. Um, uh, so you're going to address me essentially uh, along the lines of your first three grounds of appeal. Yes. Well then please uh, make such admissions as um, you'd like to. And I think I will, if I may, so just quickly skip through what, what I've written. 
yes. um, something I wish to correct. Uh, and, and then, sir, so I do have, I will then sir, attempt to take you on a, to some particular documents which I think are, are helpful. Yes. Now, so we have, sir, the 44A, um, RDC 44.8, permission to appeal. The court considers that the appeal would have a real prospect for some other compelling reason. Yes. And I think, sir, we've got the, uh, as Justice Moore uh, says in AD and RM, which in fact, sir, echoes Lord Moore, uh, then Master of the Rolls, I think, in Swain and Hillman. Yes. Um, and then uh, another case, sir, which I footnoted rather than cited, uh, at, at nine, says AA in the Upper Tribunal, paragraph 68. And I think this gets closer, I think, sir, to the um, perhaps the, the freewheeling analysis that or uh, that really needs to be undertaken uh, on on a lead to appeal basis, sir. and that is as follows: that His Honour Judge Ball QC considered that the case was realistically arguable that the case could be put forward as an appropriate one for relief under the CART test, and I would suggest that he did not. He was quite entitled. And then, sir, I, I get on to compelling reason, and, and I, I think, sir, as Your Honour has rightly indicated, uh, the greater strength of our argument perhaps uh, rests on the real prospect of yeah. success. But, but I do point out, sir, uh, that it, it can certainly be said um, that even quite subjective reasons can be compelling reasons to allow an appeal. Albeit, sir, that there's no point in having um, a compelling reason all on its own, which doesn't have some linkage uh, to some prospect of success. Uh, for example, sir, uh, the fact that um, Mr. Uh, Al Qarafi, in this case, says that he's lost $37 million uh, US dollars, um, to say that that all by itself is, is a compelling reason uh, because of the obvious uh, difficulties. great deal of the personal financial difficulty that that would cause them, cause them. By itself, sir, that can't be a compelling reason unless there's some linkage. I, I go on to say, sir, that then we've come to the issue here where uh, there's only one level of appeal in, in the DIFC court, sir. And there's, there's an issue, and, and I think uh, it can be better expressed, sir, by saying when it comes to the compelling reasons for an appeal, uh, they can be less compelling in a first appeal than is necessary in a second appeal, sir. Not quite sure I follow the logic of it. What's behind this submission? Well, sir, the, the point being, the fact, sir, if I take your honour to the authority, Sixty-eight. Sixty-eight. Yes. Middle bottom, sir. Yes. And then uh, paragraph twenty-eight, as it is there. Which it it's might help if you gave me the tab number. Oh, I'm sorry. That would be tab four, sir. So the name, the, the name of the case. AA case. The yes. R on the application of AA. Oh, there. Yes, I'm there. Tribunal. Sorry, sir. And that itself, sir, is quoting uh, the uh, Court of Appeal, sir, in the JD Combo case. But at the bottom of the page 20, paragraph 28, sir, we accept, and the, the quoted the submission from the PR case, sir. Yes. We accept, however, that both the Upland case and the Cart case would 
directly concerned with true seeking appeals. A slightly less demanding standard may be appropriate where there's only one, been only one level of judicial consideration. Uh, as Brooke, Lord Justice Brooke, realised in the Cramp case, uh, there is room for some flexibility having regards to the provenance of the appeal. Uh, this might, in some cases, be a factor in the overall evaluation of the compelling reason. You were reading from paragraph 28, were you? 28, and then the quoted submission within 28, so starting with we accept. I'm being very slow. This is the Queen on the application of A. Yes, sir. Paragraph 28. Ah, well, I must say, sir, there's, there's in effect two paragraphs. If you can see this, because it's a quoted submission, sir, which it's the quoted submission itself uh, starts at paragraph uh, 58 of yeah. the decision. You've got to give me the page again. Yeah, that page number, sir, was 68, 68. right at the bottom middle. All right, there we go. <coughs> Paragraph 28. Yes, I see. Just give me a moment. Thank you. Yes. And indeed, sir, the, the, the point I made immediately before that uh, about there, there being necessity for a, for a linkage, not only must your reason be compelling, but even if it is, there must be some uh, legal prospect of success. And, and that, sir, is perhaps encapsulated at the bottom of paragraph 26 uh, at the top of the same page. Uh, in our view, correctly, that absence of sufficiently serious legal basis for challenging tribunal's decision, extreme consequences would not suffice. Yeah, this was this was an immigration case, was it? Yes, it was. Someone who um, someone who would be someone claiming asylum. In, in, indeed, sir. Have, uh, the consequences for whom a negative decision would be um, Extremely drastic. Exactly. Yeah. Iraqi, I understand. Yeah. Oh. And a Kurdish refugee. I think to, to round off that, sir, um, for, for the first level of appeal, we've got real prospect of success um, and compelling reason. Yes. Uh, your reason not. not can be subjectively compelling, um, but even so, it must have some linkage uh, with a prospect for success. It's generally um, a lower standard required. Uh, and then, sir, in the second, for a second appeal, uh, the first limb differs. It's no longer a real prospect of success. It becomes uh, an important point of principle for the first limb. It's much higher, of course, sir. Uh, and the second limb remains the same compelling reason. But uh, again, I repeat the submission, sir, a, a first level compelling reason can be less compelling than a second level compelling reason, which must be correspondingly more compelling. That's perhaps, I, I think, all I need to say about that, sir. I, I do resolve from paragraph 46 of my submissions. Um, I'm not sure that the decisions, the second lines there, sir, I'm not sure that the decisions of the Courts of England and Wales in relation to this point need to be uh, watered down or read down, other than as explained um, for a first appeal versus second appeal, uh, because uh, the tests, sir, in uh, rules of the DIFC courts 44.8, which we're considering, is, is really identical. 
is in fact identical to uh, CPR 52.3 bracket 6. So it is, it is an identical test, and I'd overlook that when I wrote that sentence. Yeah. But um, 47 sir, uh, I think uh, I hold to. That is that the advantages inherent in an appellate bench uh, cannot respectively solidify the match by a judge alone hearing short application on a essentially a threshold basis. Indeed, it is not the purpose of the leave application for there to be a detailed consideration or determination uh, of the case on its merits. And indeed, that leads to what uh, Lord Diplock said uh, in 1982, sir. The whole purpose of requiring leave uh, that leave should first be obtained to make an application for judicial review, I submit it's the same here, sir, would be defeated uh, if the court were to go into the matter in any, any depth at that stage. If, on a quick perusal of the material then available, the court thinks that it discloses what on further consideration turn out to be an arguable case in favour of granting to the applicant the relief claimed, it ought, in the exercise of judicial discretion, give him leave to apply for that relief. And um, that this, this is a question of construction. Yes. Of a few words in an order, isn't it? Uh, arising from the claimant's apostrophe, S apostrophe relationship with A.B. Casey. Yeah. Well, in, in terms of the approach that uh, His Honour Justice Giles took, well, yes, sir, but the approach that I suggest to the court is we really ought to go, when interpreting those words, I agree, we ought to go back to where His Honour uh, Sir John Chadwick was on the 28th. Well, that's October. construing the... I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no, no. That, that's construing the words against the relevant backdrop. Yes, exactly. Now, um, assembling the relevant backdrop is not um, a very laborious exercise, though. Exactly. Case. It can be readily assembled, and then it's a matter of construction. And both when the court is considering whether to grant summary judgment and when it is considering whether to grant permission to appeal, will often, if it is satisfied that the issue can be <coughs> looked at with a view to decide, in effect, deciding the issue by deciding that there is no reasonable prospect of success, and that can be achieved will get on and do it. That's part of the function of the filter yes. constituted by the requirement for permission to appeal. Applications for the judicial review, particularly in the immigration sphere, are very different. Um. AA case was a decision um, which was at least discussing the decision uh, quoted here as Cart. And Cart uh, was a case in, I think, the House of Lords, sir, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, deciding uh, on, on what basis uh, to accept a leave applications in relation to judicial review from the upper tribunal uh, and whether. Uh, to impose the same tests uh, as are applicable uh, for leave to appeal, and in that deciding sir, that it should. So the same, the same tests apply. Well, I think you'd accept that it is commonplace mm. um, in England and in other common law jurisdictions where there is a requirement for leave to establish a threshold, yes, sir. that if the court can consistently, uh, within the constraints of a relatively short summary application, determine that <coughs> the point's a bad point, it gets on and so determined. Yes, absolutely, sir. Yeah. Now, um, I think, sir, the oral reconsideration here, and you want to dealt with 
I'm now on page 15 of my submissions, yes. paragraph 51. I think you want to deal with that immediately at the beginning of the hearing, and I have nothing just further to say in relation yes. to that. Yes. Now, now we in fact come to uh, Justice Giles' decision, sir. And where I say, with respect, that Your Honour should depart from the decision of Justice Giles is here, sir. The, the approach of the learned judge was to ascertain what had been said in, in paragraph 428 of the 21st of August 2014 judgment. And there, uh, there was a mistake in the uh, appellant's grounds of appeal, sir, where they said that uh, it was the same in paragraph 428 uh, as, as was set out in 3B and 5B. Clearly it wasn't. 428 so just dealt with interest in relation to the ABK loans. Yes, Three B and five B were, were much more widely drawn, arising yeah. from the relationship with ABK. Yeah. So I, I accept that, that that distinction, sir. But perhaps it doesn't matter too much. Um, for indeed, sir, I'll hope to develop the point later that there was a progression of thinking from the relatively restricted uh, grounds set out in four to eight to the wider grounds uh, set out in three B and five B. Uh, to the slightly wider again grounds which were required uh, on the 12th and 13th of January uh, and were granted but should have been. So, the next thing that his honour just, and I'm 55 2 of my submissions now, sir, yes. ascertain what had been said in the 28 October order, particularly 3B and 5B. Three, confirm the view of his honour, just Deputy Chief Justice Sir John Chadwick expressed in the judgment dated 13 January that the RAC for evidence did not meet the criteria for admission of evidence as determined in earlier hearings, and in particular 28 October suit. Well, those are not the words of um, Justice Giles, are they? Those are your words. Those are my words, indeed. Yeah. Yes. And, and, but I have um, the next page, sir, I think, yes. set out uh, exactly what Justice Giles did say. That's in paragraph 65 of, of my submission, sir. Yes. But if, if I could just press Take on. your time. Take your yes, time. thank you, sir. Yes. Uh, now, I, I concede in paragraph 56, top of page 16, sir, that uh, Justice Giles' contention uh, that as to what the Deputy Chief Justice contended uh, were correct uh, in that Sir John Chadwick did not intend to include consequential loss which arose from the other than borrowing from ABK which funded the investments with the defendants. Okay. So um, I think it, it's, it's reasonable to say that the 28 October order did say this is limited to evidence which arises from the claimant's S apostrophe relationship with ABK, which arises from the borrowings from that bank to fund the loans with the Saracen defendant banks. That's what he intended to say, and when he was presented with something different on the, two, on the 12th and the 13th of January, Dismissed it. That's that's what he did, and that is what Justice Giles found that he did, uh, and found that he was correct to do so. Sir. Fifty-seven. The learned judge's decision did not follow the approach put forth by learned counsel in either the notice of appeal or the skeleton argument. Uh, those documents that submitted articulate a very clear case for the grant of leave. Uh, the points being well capable. And then I also mentioned, sir, further uh, the importance of the matter to the intended appellant, the desirability of dealing with all the litigation within the existing factual matrix means that there are compelling reasons to let the appeal go forward. And when you say in paragraph 57, yes, sir. So when you refer to the notice of appeal or the scheduling argument, you mean the notice of appeal and the skeleton argument served in support of an appeal Correct, sir. from Sir John Chadwick 
the yes. order of the 12th of January. Yes, indeed, I do, sir. The appeal, the notice of, um, sorry, the grounds of appeal, it says, yeah. 27th January, and the subsequent skeleton article yeah. was in support. Now, the realistically arguable case, um, if I could go to 60, sir, the background to the rat fall losses is important. The hearing of the substantive case took place from, and I've got September, sir, but in fact it was 10 July. I apologise for that. If, if Your Honour would be kind enough to cross out September and put 10 July. Can you help me with this? Yes. There was no split trial. Correct. In the course of the hearing of the trial, did the judge decide that he would not go into matters of quantum, but would <coughs> make uh, important findings from which <coughs> um, issues of quantum could then be addressed. I'm struggling to put my finger on it, sir, but it may be rather cold to eight, indeed, uh, of the 21 August decision. Um, just as Sir John Chadwick says, I have dealt with every with everything that I have been asked to decide. So uh, he left open in four to eight uh, the interest. Uh, well, he left open the whole question of quantification of any of the lots. That I I think it's fair to say, sir, um, did come later uh, on a consideration of his judgment of the 21st of August and, and what it meant. But it seems fairly clear that the parties were preparing for a trial of all issues. Yes. E evidence was served in respect of issues of quantum, of the problem with bank statements which hadn't been delivered by ABK. But otherwise, and there were some, I think some accountants reports and that sort of thing. But then At some point, it was clearly decided by the learned judge that he would, he was confronted with a very long and heavy judgment dealing with liability issues, that he would limit that to the determination, the determination of those issues. He accepted the submission of Mr. Brindle that um, the parties having, they're not having been a split trial, that uh, uh, generally speaking, any further evidence as to quantum should only deal with post-judgment events. Yes, sir. Which seems to indicate quite strongly that when the parties went into bat or went into bowl at the beginning of the trial, um, the issue of quantum was they anticipated to be decided in the course of the trial. I, um, yes, sir, I think that's an accurate summary, indeed, to which it could be added that I, I think that uh, Mr. Al Karate, at least, uh, was a little surprised, somewhat disappointed, uh, to find out what the intended quantum or the quantum arising from the 21st of August decision um, was going to be followed fairly quickly sir, by a change of solicitors uh, and the um, motion brought forward on the 28, 27, 28 of October sir, to make sure that the judgment did in fact gather up all the available damages uh, and so I think it's fair to say sir, that by 27, 28 October, there was a much greater focus on the damages that should arise naturally from the 21st August judgment. And whilst there wasn't a split trial, sir, um, of course that can be ordered at any time. And in a de facto way, I accept that uh, there has been at least two separate considerations of the case. One, substantively up to uh, in May to July 2013 and, and
the other ones who are going from October through to January um, 2015. Not entirely satisfactory, Sue, but dealt with in the interests of justice, I'm sure. And indeed, Sue, um, that same theme uh, should be uh, continued here. So, uh, the hearing, so we've got substantive issue, a judgment on the 21st of August, sir. Hearing is to the interim award of damages and costs, 28 October, um, and the decision whether to allow that evidence to be reduced or placed on the 12th and 13th of January. A quantum hearing took place on the 2nd and 3rd of March. Uh, now, this is where I think it, it gets interesting, sir, and I might uh, be best to diverge slightly from the written script and into some of the evidence. Now, 61, sir. At the hearing of the, on the 27th of October, uh, claimant's counsel was able to tell the Deputy Chief Justice that there was evidence of post-trial losses. Uh, importantly, counsel recognised the inadequacy of the instructions but stated that it was an ABK loss. Uh, Mr Hill further stated Time to argue about its admissibility was when it went in. And I think, sir, the reference there is to tab 14. Now, it may be, sir, that there was some confusion right there between um, the judge and senior counsel as to what exactly this evidence was going to be. Well, Mr. Hill told the judge yes. that um, he hadn't been didn't have full instructions exactly. on these recallment or closure losses. The way he put it to the judge was, uh, looking at the extract in paragraph 24 of Justice Giles's um, reasons, I can tell my lord that since the trial there have been some foreclosures on property as a result of the ABK lending. Yes, sir. Uh, the only ABK lending known to the court was the lending to finance the investments. But ABK was indeed Mr. Karafi's bank for, for all purposes. Yes, but now, when one comes to RAK4, yes, uh, the lending which has <coughs> given rise to the foreclosure was not lending for the purposes of acquiring the investment. Correct. It was 
blending for the purposes of having a, uh, for a building project, or to which is land. The land standing as security for the lending. Completely different. But the question that we speak to is not whether it's one or the other, but whether the property arises from the losses caused by the defended banks. No, it's not. The question is, what is the proper construction of the order the judge made? And when one looks at the relevant background, and that's what we're doing here by looking at this exchange between Mr. Hill and the judge, uh, we know that there's a reference to foreclosure losses. But what the judge is told can only have been understood by the judge. And who knows? probably understood by Mr. Hill, who was on the instructor, that these foreclosures arose out of the ABK lending for the purpose of the investment. Quite so. Well, that's the factual matrix of the order. Well, perhaps I, sh I should approach it another way, because this is, I think, with respect to, this is, this is the nub of it. That was the factual matrix of the order. And the basis upon which the judge made that order was the information given to him by Mr. Hill. Mm. That information, quite certain that Mr. Hill uh, told it as uh, accurately as he could, yeah. deeply qualified it um, by saying, I'm not, I'm not certain of this. Yes. That information turned out, regrettably, to be wrong. The orders which followed said were made to accommodate what Mr. Hill had said. Now, if what Mr. Hill should have said subsequently turned out to be something different, should the orders not be similarly adjusted? And with respect to it, I say that the orders should be adjusted. That well, the orders should not be set in stone. Put it this way, sir. This was always a case on a, on a no transaction basis. And I, I did refer you on to paragraph 14, to tab 14 earlier, sir. And that was to paragraph 8 of the judge's schedule of reasons. Which That's judge? A, a, a Justice uh, Sir John Chadwick's. Yes. Tab 14, sir. Paragraph eight of the oh, yes, this is the big judge. No, it's oh, no, no, the small judge. No, it's the small one after the big one, yeah. And uh, perhaps I can just read it to you if you want, because it's, it's a very short point. Yes. This is a, the claimant's approach to is a, a, a new transaction basis. Put the uh, claimants back in the position that they would have been if none of this had ever occurred in the first place. Yeah. Okay. At paragraph eight, accordingly, as I sought to explain in my judgment, the only sensible basis upon which compensation could be ordered was the actual loss suffered on the sale of investments. That's, that's His Honour Justice Chadwick's reasoning at 28 October. Allied to that, we have paragraph 428 of the big judgment, sir. Yes. And that, sir, whilst I'm yeah. terribly sorry, Mr. Barnum. Oh, I was a little behind you when you were dealing with the um, what's at tab four. What's at tab four is the order made on the 28th of October. Uh, tab 14. One I beg your pardon, tab 14. Yes. And then. And you will read, just tell me what paragraph you were uh, reading from? It's. There's two eights, so there's the order and the reasons, and it's paragraph eight of the reasons. Oh, paragraph eight of the reasons. Eight. My, my mistake. Just well, give it, might, it might be my no, no, just accent, give sir. Even in New Zealand, they can't understand me, sir.
So that's that's a short point. Then we have Sir. Uh, it's actually one tab back, and only actually two pages back into the next tab. Yeah. Two, yeah. Right at the end of tab thirteen, Sir. Yeah. And we've got four two eight. Yes. Of the big decision, Sir. Quantum. Mm -hmm. Now, there, Sir. As Honour Justice Chadwick deals with other fees and interest charged by Bank Saracen. Mm -hmm. Other fees and interest charged by Bank Saracen. These are not agreed yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and loss. And then in the narrative part of 428, he says, ABK losses are only calculated 14 December 2009 as the claimants only have accounts. And, and then to, says that uh, the claimants also seek interest. So short point in terms of paragraph 428, sir, is that the court anticipates a calculation of damages for post-trial events. Well, if, if the passage of time will be a post-trial event and his interest is um, running, that will be a post-trial matter. Yes. Yeah. And, and indeed, sir, as we'll come to in a minute, Justice Sir John Chadwick was quite amenable to the suggested evidence put forward um, by Mr Hill. Indeed, sir, uh, he expanded the scope of the orders from what was set out in 428 of his 21 August judgment to what we see in 3C and 5C of the 28 October judgment. So there was always a manifest intention to include additional evidence. And as your honour mentioned before, this, this was not a split trial, but that's not determinative in my submissions. A split trial can be ordered uh, at any time, uh, any evidence or loss or damages uh, can be uh, considered discreetly. Now, my next point, sir, is at hearing on the 28th of October, uh, and that is the passage well, we looked at. The 27th of October. 27th, you're quite right, my yeah. apologies. We have the passage we looked at where Mr Hill told his honour of the intended evidence. Uh, the evidence at that time, of course, was, as we've discussed, it was, it was very fresh, sir. Um, the chronology shows that uh, the foreclosure had in fact occurred in uh, June 2014, uh, in Kuwait, moreover, sir. So getting the information, um, having it uh, transcribed, having it uh, translated, sir, and indeed, even having somebody recognise that this was potentially important, sir, um, would, would take up that time period. At the same time, sir, you do have the, a natural flurry of activity, so there's plenty of reasons, sir, why uh, it wasn't there uh, for, for Mr Hill in, in a sworn form. Well, when um, was the foreclosure? Just remind me, when was the sale? June 2014, sir. Uh, and here we are in October. And the hearing on the 27th, 28th of October is, is effectively to determine what was to come next, sir. And orders followed from that that this evidence be produced. Uh, and so it was thereafter, sir, put together. So the, the error, sir, slight as it was, is in my submission not that significant when it comes to dealing with this application. What, he, what Mr Hill said to my submission was correct as to his instructions. Uh, there was an element of absolute coincidence there, sir, yeah, in that ABK had not one set of lending, sir, but two sets of lending. The 28 October judgment, sir, was a, a damning indictment of the commercial behaviour of the defendants, 
and the judge uh, contemplated then the additional heads of losses. And clearly, sir, he anticipated the sort of evidence that Mr. Hill was suggesting. Because, and, and the proof of that, sir, uh, is at, I think, tab 2, uh, paragraph 25. And that is, sir, the exchange between His Honour, Deputy Chief Justice Chadwick, and counsel for the second defendant, We what 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 hearing was this? That's this is on the twenty uh, seventh. This is oh. the 27th. Yes, yes, yes. 23. Yeah. This is on, this yeah. is on the 27th. I take your honour, say, to the four paragraphs from the bottom, it says the judge, in effect, posing argument with counsel, says, well, half a dozen of our properties have been the subject of a forced sale, and the result of that uh, is that we have lost 20 or 30 percent of the value of those properties because they were the subject of a forced sale. Uh, they would have to establish that the properties were sold by the bank, effectively by ABK and they will have to establish what the loss on market value was. Counsel, well, they will have to establish a causal link to what has been found against the defendants. Judge, well, they will have to show that the forced sales were as a result of the investments which they made with your bank. Yes, which could be quite a complex matter, which is a point I'm just making, which may require significant disclosure. And then, I think importantly, sir, the judge, well, they will have to meet that problem when it arises, but I am not shutting them out from trying to. And, and indeed, sir, if we go to, say, the skeleton argument, sir, and paragraph, which is the next tab, tab 4, and paragraph 28, it's on page 8 of, of the skeleton argument, One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes. This sir, is, a, is a narrative yeah. of the intended claim. Yeah. What was brought, brought forward, sir, is what was discussed at the 27th October hearing. But that that uh, discussion was surely all on the basis that the the uh, lending which had led to the foreclosures was related to the <coughs> borrow for the investments. Well, uh, to borrow an argument from the defendants, sir, it really comes down to causation. Well, and uh, it doesn't. It comes down to, as Justice Giles said, doesn't it? What's the proper construction of those words in the order? Uh -huh. well, Justice, Gi Justice uh, Sir John Chadwick, sir, is a, he's a leading giant. He's a very precise man, sir. He drafted the order on the 28th of October in accordance with what he understood the intended well, evidence you said was that going did to that be. On the understanding that these foreclosures were a consequence of collateral lending that had nothing to do with the purchase of the investments. Well, 
well, well, yes, because it's the causal link, as, as the defendant's counsel, Mr. Black QC, pointed out, that, that's important here, sir. Mr. Karathi, he, he's got, in his essence, two loans. He's got loan one with the Saracens. Never, this was never spelled out to the judge. It would be, wouldn't it? I don't know. I want you to, to, to respond. It would be extraordinary if the um, judge proceeded on the, the basis on the 27th of October that he was making an order that would capture foreclosures arising out of lending that was not for the purpose of these investments, but which was collateral. Collateral in the sense that it was to do with a completely separate transaction. True, there may be an argument as to causation. It may be said that those loans could have been serviced and foreclosure um, avoided <coughs> if <coughs> the borrowing had never been made and all the investments had held their business, held their value, and there hadn't been closed out. And, and that, sir, with respect to the cause of action. And it's an available one. Uh, it details a loss. Uh, and, and it should have been put forward. And with respect, who, and if we look at that passage, the cited passage there in, uh, is cited in Justice Giles' judgment. Who, uh, or the exact terms of the lending, don't really enter into it. They weren't, weren't discussed. Does it matter, with, with the greatest respect, sir, whether it is the lending to fund the Saracen investments, which was supposed to fund itself, or the lending which fell over as a result of the Saracen investment being unable to fund itself? That's what Mr. Karafi says. I, I had two loans. Everything was fine. Loan one to the, Sar to the Saracens, it was going to fund itself from the coupons, but the coupons never arrived. As a consequence of the coupons never arriving, in fact, they were never going to be, they were never going to arrive on the evidence. As a consequence of that not arising, my other loans, uh, which I had intended to fund myself until the tower was built and was income producing, uh, I could no longer service those loans. The bank took my property and they subsequently sold it at undervalue, significantly undervalue. Therefore, I have suffered a loss, and he's added it up to her, and he says it's 37 million US dollars. Um, causal link. So but the judge clearly yes. was um, concerned to deduce the consequences of his conclusions as to liability. And so he, that explains why he had a paragraph identifying the losses that were going to be relevant to computation. Now he uh, proceeded on the basis of how the case had been put uh, at trial, which would have reflected the state of the pleadings and the openings they opened, they opened conference, that's clear from reading parts of the transcript. <coughs> and <coughs> the purpose of that paragraph, I think it was paragraph 128, Brian, I may be wrong about that. But the purpose, therefore, was to bring some definition and boundaries to what the consequential um, hearing and issues were to be concerned with. Now, <coughs> he hears reference to foreclosures from Mr. Hill. Foreclosures that are said to be related to the borrowing. And so the words, <coughs> I think it was the relationship with ADK that come into the order. It's then he would say, anyway, that it's plain that the judge was proceeding.
proceeding on the basis that these foreclosures arose out of uh, borrowings for the investment. Nobody told him to the contrary. And <coughs> an order of them is made, the purpose of which is to fix the ongoing consequences of the judgment. That's how litigation is managed. And um, uh, it's then a question of construing the order. And the threat of foreclosure must have been hovering over the first claimant for some considerable time. He was in straightened consequences. But none of this was communicated It wasn't that the the, the 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 actual factual basis for the foreclosure claim was not disclosed to the judge on the twenty seventh of October, and an order is drawn up, and <coughs> it's a question of construing the order. There's been no appeal against the order of the judge, has there? On from the twenty eighth, sir. Yeah. Well, well, there hasn't, has there? No, but well, that's that's it. That's the order. That stands as a valid order. And the question then is, well, what does it mean? Now, I quite understand your argument. You, you, you certainly understand. I it, say, you, 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 you say, well, look, come on. Um, that order's got to be construed to be consistent with a claim for damage which is uh, <coughs> in line with the no transaction approach throughout the trial, uh, and as to which there is a perfectly arguable causation theory. That's your thesis. I understand. And further, who's to say that if it had been put correctly Justice on the 27th of October, that the order which followed wouldn't have encompassed well, that's the That's a funny old submission when you look at his uh, the, uh, the, the, the decision he came to in January. Anybody can understand his irritation, sir. Uh, at, at, he, he makes a generous order, something else turns up. Uh, why wouldn't um, he dismiss it? Question is, sir, whether he was right to do so. And one has to go back to that 28 October order, sir, and say, was it drawn on the right factual basis? No, well, sir. Well, that would go to drawn the order. You haven't appealed the order. Well, if, if it's simply a matter of expanding the compass of our appeal, sir, I'll, I'll make that application now. No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> well, I can appreciate that, sir, but perhaps it's a matter... Of, of reserving leave for us to do so now that the, the, the matter has has arisen. Now I'm simply going to deal with the application that's before the court. Very well, sir. I, I can well appreciate that, how much uh, leeway should one be allowed. But uh, where there's a wrong, there's a right, sir. And, and there, is a, there is a wrong there. There was a failure of process. And, and there must be a way of putting it right. What do you and, mean a failure of process? As, as we've discussed, sir, Mr. Hill, with the greatest good faith in the world, put forward a version of events which, is, which reflected his instructions at the time, which regrettably, when the evidence arrived, turned out to be significantly, but understandably, different. And as a consequence of him giving version A, the orders were drawn, uh, when the evidence arrived in, in form B, uh, it was excluded, sir. But it's evidence which uh, otherwise might have made it uh, into a hearing, sir, and been adjudicated on, because there is a tenable cause of action there. And appeal courts do have curative powers, sir. I mean, even, I don't mean to say even, but, but certainly, sir, 
as I've set out in paragraph 65 of my submissions, uh, His Honour Justice Giles, at paragraph 19 of his decision, that pre tab to 19, but it's in my written submissions. Yes, yes. At, at 65, says, it is not whether the rack or loss is a loss recoverable as compensation pursuant to the articles of regulation of the regulatory law. This, the learned judges accepting, well, maybe your loss is recoverable, but he's saying it's whether it was a loss within the meaning of those words, the now famous words from 28 October, sir. Well, well with respect, um, if it was a tenable claim relating to post-trial losses, which, which it most certainly was, sir, and His Honour Justice Sir John Chadwick dealt with that point very comprehensively um, in the transcript, sir. It's actually the page we were looking at before that Your Honour drew my attention to. Yes. Uh, and that is uh, page 91, sir, of, of the transcript. Uh, the January tag five. Day. Yes, sir. Under tag 5. Yeah. Where... The judge says, how do you say they could have claimed this loss at trial? They had not suffered it. And Mr. Brimbrook, who are making the same point as, uh, I think Your Honour posed an argument, well, it might not, it had not been quantified, but they could have easily done it, they could have said. His Honour's view was, well, it's not just quantifying it, you do not suffer a loss until you have a sale at undervalue. So they, it was truly a post-trial loss. There's an unfortunate miscommunication to the court. Um, nobody's fault, but perhaps the, the military solicitors who, who should and perhaps have uh, drawn a brief draft brief of evidence um, and had put it before counsel of hearing, sir. But um, the client shouldn't suffer for that. Uh, as a result, sir, um, Mr. Al Karafi faces missing out on having a very substantial claim adjudicated upon. Uh, and I, I would posit, sir, that uh, if he tries to come again with this claim, he'll be met with uh, an abusive process argument saying, well, you could and should have brought this in the first place. Even if he doesn't face that argument, sir, there's, there's still the overall interest of justice and the balance of convenience in having all justiciable matters dealt with uh, in the confines of the one hearing before the one judge uh, who has made the important findings of fact. Mm -hmm. Now, looking at time, sir, There was a lot made in, in objection to this, sir, and it, it's, it's not reflected in the judgment, but I, I do want to deal with it, that there was an, almost an interorum argument or a, a floodgates argument that if you let this in, it will take forever and forever. Um, dealing with this can, can be done, done quite succinctly, uh, sir, by, if leave is granted, uh, this would be dealt with presumably at, at the same time uh, as the uh, appeals which have already been filed against the decision of 21 and 28 October. Is uh, there any <coughs> indication as to when those appeals might be heard? Yes, sir. Um, somewhere between September and perhaps November. For this year? This year. It's, it's certainly intended for this year, sir. Uh, we can council, council That's hasn't a talked. great day, isn't it? Yes, it is, sir. Um, a date was found, but regrettably, I think our lead council could not attend. Um, there's been some difficulties, but even this morning, sir, there's been email chatter uh, dealing with September versus November for the hearing. And in the way of things, sir, uh, His Honour Sir John Chadwick's quantum decision is, is imminent, sir. Um, when that is delivered, no doubt there'll be an appeal against that. So there's, there's going to be um, further consideration of these matters, perhaps 
there will be some remission or, or further hearing in relation to quantum C. Um, this matter can be dealt with distinctly and, and very easily and preferably by the trial judge. And I do, sir, I, I, I realise, sir, that um, it's always an uphill battle with an appeal, sir, but uh, could you say that there's no real prospect of success in, in, terms, of the, in terms of the argument? Um, yes, uh, His Honour, Sir John Chadwick, sir, made a, a very precise order. Sadly, um, had he known what we later found out on the 20th of November, when the RAP4 evidence came, sir, uh, he may well have drafted it differently. And with respect, sir. But as I said to you, the difficulty with that submission is that he is his decision in January. And I, I accept that, sir. But if, if that was all that was a bar to this matter, Succeeding. Um, respectfully, sir, I, I would seek that um, some uh, leeway or further leave be granted uh, for an appeal out of time in relation to the 28th of October. Indeed, sir, the appellant, the uh, Karaki parties did appeal the 28th of October um, order, now that, now that I recall, uh, by um, notice of appeal dated the 5th of October and sadly I, was, I left that on my desk I didn't bring that appeal notice there but it doesn't cover this point but that could be amended What, they, they, they appealed the 28th of October order? Yes, they Did they? The, the, an appeal filed on the 5th of November sir, um, dealing with points which arise from both the 21st of August and the Now, I should know the exact answer to that, sir. Uh, perhaps I find well, I think I ought to see that. Has I that been filed? Is, is yes. That, that's, a live, that's a live procedure. Filed two respondents' notices last week, sir. Respondents' notices? Because there was a, res a, a claimant's appeal dated the 5th of, uh, 5th of November. There were two appeals by the first defendant and the second defendant, dated the 6th of November, sir, one day afterwards. Um, leave was granted in relation to both of those matters. Uh, the first one in De the first defendant's leave was granted in December, sir, and the second defendant's leave was granted on the 2nd of uh, February, sir, by Justice Giles. Yes. Uh, and as a consequence of, uh, but with conditions, sir, and the conditions were not settled until the 6th of April, 5th of April, again by Justice Giles, the conditions of leave for the second defendant. Uh, and from then, sir, uh, the claimant's appeal was reformulated as a respondent's notice and filed. 28 well, April. Um, I want to be provided with the original notices of, the, of appeal of the claimants yes, sir. against the order made on the 28th of October. And if it's morphed into a respondent's notice, it's the respondent's notice. I'll certainly supply those this afternoon, sir. I would add almost certainty that they don't cover this point. Yes, you're not making a... You're not founding any arguments on those. No. You're, you're informing me that that's the situation. Yes. Yes. For convenience, um, any any appeal yes. could be attached to them. I understand. That's why you're informing me. But I think I will see. So can you get those e emailed to the court? Absolutely. Certainly before... I'll be able to do this tomorrow morning. Shall we do? Yes. Yes. I, I think, Sue, that concludes my submission. Yes. Well, Mr. Barber, thank you very much. I'm most grateful thank you, for sir. your submissions. Uh, and I shall um, reserve my judgment.
Thank you. I'll rise. I'll rise. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Still in the job.